thank you for asking me to speak to you this morning. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties there. Um, so I want to start by talking about uh, the history of the technological liberties movement and um, what this current moment says about it. So there's a kind of revisionist version of what people who we call today techno-optimists were really all about, why they went out and founded activist groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, why they argued about things like source code licensing and transparency, net neutrality, and so on. And the revisionist story goes that naive tech bros thought that technology would make everything great automatically. And all they wanted to do was make sure that the big government kept their hands off technology so it could just succeed on its own. And there are certainly people who kind of fit into that lens. Some of them were ideologically motivated. There's, there's people on the libertarian right who felt that way. And some of them were motivated by self-interest. I think when Mark Zuckerberg said, you know, once we connect everyone in the world to Facebook, the world will be a better place. It wasn't so much ideology, except to the extent that ideology consists of, if I were a lot richer, the world would be a better place. So that's some of it. But for the most part, the people who got involved in these fights uh, out of principle, the thing that they were worried about was not that technology would be awesome and we had to get out of its way, but that unless technology was awesome, it would be terrible. Right? As, as Michael Weinberg put it in his white paper, this will all be so great if we don't screw it up. That on the one hand, you know, we could use networks to have cryptography that would allow us to maintain privacy. On the other hand, in the absence of cryptography, networks would be an open book for auto, uh, autocratic states and, and oppressive uh, authoritarian states. Um, and uh, for the last uh, 30, 30 years, 40 years, we have been arguing with people about whether or not uh, any of this stuff actually matters. You, you may remember this uh, now infamous Malcolm Gladwell editorial where he said, you know, people who believe that uh, protest and political activism takes place online need their heads examined. Uh, real civil rights fights involve getting your head broken on the bridge uh, by Bill Connor and wearing out your shoe leather, ringing on doorbells, not clicking on links or organizing denial of service attacks. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, all of these fights from net neutrality to source code transparency to competition and so on, were viewed first as um, distractions, right, from, from the real fights that we had, and then uh, were erased from history, right, as people started to wake up and go, oh, wait a second, tech has become this force for incredible evil, right, that we're now all in the midst of this mass surveillance, and um, it is uh, possible now for uh, you know, rich people to use technology to identify and neutralize their adversaries, and uh, the lack of competition has created these choke points where big firms get to control our discourse. N now, all of that concern has been erased and replaced with this, you know, frankly, uh, incredibly frustrating rhetoric that goes like, why weren't you people more alive to this risk for the last 30 years when you were arguing for all of these distractions? Why, why weren't you arguing for the stuff that mattered, like competition and net neutrality and source code transparency and privacy? And, and of course, that is uh, very, very frustrating. But it also, <clears throat> um, there is, I think, a natural ex and wider explanation for why these things did not become part of our discourse and take on this, this urgency that they have now back when they would have been easier to deal with, back when they were still nascent phenomena, back when, for example, we were arguing about whether software should have copyright at all, or whether there should be patents, or whether government should ever uh, procure software without being able to see the source code, or whether anyone should procure software without being able to see the source code. Uh, and, and the reason that those fights were not uh, uh, urgent over the last 30 years is the same reason that cancer is not urgent when you start smoking. That the uh, cause and the effect are separated by so much time and space that it's very hard to not hyperbolically discount the long-term effects and assign a huge premium to the short-term convenience, right? The short-term convenience of um, being able to just buy the software that's for sale without having to argue with the vendor about source code licensing or just get the internet from a giant operator that's willing to ex do the capital expenditures to bring it to your door um, without having to argue about whether 
states should procure fiber capacity for themselves and then maybe lease the lines to private operators or, or, or what have you, right? It's much easier to just use the internet than it is to worry about the internet's destiny, especially if it's working okay for now. Um, but over time, the cause and the effect become much more manifest, right? If you smoke long enough, eventually you will probably get cancer, right? And at that point, it's a lot harder to deny the cause and the effect. And there's a problem with, with that as the answer to solving any kind of crisis, to wait till the problem is, is so manifest that it can't be denied. And that problem is that sometimes it's then too late to do anything about it. And that the, the inverse of, of denialism is nihilism, right? That's, that's what comes after denial is the idea that it's just too late to do anything about it, so you might as well just go on with the status quo. And we've all met people who are like, well, it's too late for me now. I'm sure I'm going to get lung cancer someday. I might as well enjoy this cigarette while I can. And there is another struggle that looks a lot like this, uh, and it's one that's intimately related to both the story of tech and the story of the pandemic, which is climate change. Climate change is one of those things where the cause and the effect are separated by a lot of time and space. And just like things like source code transparency or net neutrality or whether cigarettes cause cancer, there is a lot of money to be made in denying the truth of the problem. Right? So there is a, a, a budget and a business model for sowing denial that makes it even harder. Right? As if it wasn't hard enough to figure out which causes had which effects, there is a business model in confusing people about which causes have which effects. And, and that makes things especially pernicious and difficult to deal with. Um, so the, the um, upside of the pandemic, such as it is, is that it reveals the fragility of our systems, including and especially our tech systems, when it comes to coping with a crisis. And the pandemic is not the last crisis we will endure. In fact, it's not the last pandemic we'll endure. One of the things we know about climate change is that it accelerates both zoonotic and insect-borne uh, um, uh, illness pathogens because the uh, traditional habitat of the animals that bear these pathogens uh, uh, is eradicated and new habitats open up for them. You know, wetlands become dry, dry places become wet, cold places become hot. And so you have the migration of the carriers for these pathogens into new, ha um, new uh, inhabited territories where there isn't any kind of built-up immunity, nor is there any kind of predator for, you know, say, a new uh, varietal of mosquito that finds its way in a more orderly latitude. And so we will definitely have more crises on the scale of the coronavirus pandemic. We will also have more pandemics on the scale of the coronavirus pandemic. And the good news, such as it is, about this pandemic is that because it is an accelerator and a pressurizer, Right, that reveals the things that were slow, latent, and difficult to identify within the crisis, right? within, our, within our slow moving crisis, within our status quo, it gives us the opportunity to address them. You know, if you think about uh, going to the doctor and having them swab the back of your throat and put it in a Petri dish, which is an accelerated growing medium for whatever was growing in the back of your throat, and then putting it in a warm place that further accelerates that growth for two or three days, and then going back and looking under a microscope, they can take the thing that is latent in the back of your throat and make it legible and undeniable and therefore addressable before it becomes so manifest that you are gravely ill. And in, in this important and very terrible sense, the pandemic has acted as a diagnostic for the fragility in our systems and it's given us the opportunity to address that fragility and not a moment too soon, because as I say, this is not the last crisis nor the last pandemic crisis that we will face in our lifetimes. So, um, the, uh, you know, you may uh, um, have seen, you know, that some of these things involve, uh, say, medical equipment um, and the relationship of austerity to disaster preparedness and, um, and redundancy and resilience. Uh, my favorite example of this, uh, to the extent that you can call this a favorite, is that in 2006, uh, then Governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, procured $200 million to build a stockpile of battery-powered ventilators, thousands of temporary hospital beds, two complete mobile temporary hospitals 
and millions of N95 masks. And then in the crisis of 2008, um, we reached this moment where um, the uh, uh, budget would no longer balance, right? The, the, the um, you know, business revenues fell off a cliff, tax revenues accordingly also fell off a cliff, and they went to look for savings to plug a multi-billion dollar hole in the California state budget. And the savings they found was in um, zeroing out the maintenance budget for that emergency stockpile. It was about $5 million a year. That's what it costs for the warehouses, uh, routine checks, keeping the batteries and the ventilators charged, and so on. Um, that $5 million saved since 2008 is now 5 times 12, $60 million. Um, so in theory, California has $60 million more, plus whatever interest they would have had to pay on that debt in its coffers to procure those supplies today. However, as we've discovered, um, cash is not the thing that allows governments to have capacity. Capacity is the thing that allows governments to have capacity. That, that, that no amount of dollars can make ventilators appear. The thing that would have made ventilators appear in this moment would be to have ventilators in a warehouse, right? That, that is the only way states build capacity. After all, like sovereign currency issuers, like the US federal government, can make as many dollars as they want through the simple mechanism of typing zeros into a spreadsheet at the central bank. Uh, we are seeing that today. We saw that literally yesterday where $340 billion was literally typed into existence. Uh, that $340 billion will do a lot of good, but it won't make ventilators appear. The time to have typed those zeros into the spreadsheet was a decade ago when we could have procured those ventilators from excess industrial capacity in our, uh, in our national um, uh, industrial apparatus and then we could have stuck them in a warehouse for 10 years to use now. So um, we are seeing comparable lessons, comparable elements of hindsight that uh, we can bring into our future when it comes to tech policy as a result of the pandemic. And the first one is that online life is real life, right? That, that there, the distinction is irrelevant, right? To say that you are doing, that, that um, we need to preserve digital capacity so that we can do education is true, but it's true in the same sense that we need to preserve, say, the capacity to manufacture clothing, otherwise everyone would have to go to school naked, right? Of course, education involves, inextricably involves online life. Um, likewise, political and civic engagement, likewise, romance, likewise, family life, likewise, healthcare, um, that, that all of these things are inextricable from our uh, regular policy and that anything that we wouldn't accept in the real world, we shouldn't accept in the digital world because the digital world and the real world are the same world. Um, and so uh, after the pandemic, we are going to have to readdress a lot of the uh, festering questions of digital rights that have been dismissed or sidelined for the 30 years that digital rights activists have been advocating for them. And in some ways, this is the most important moment in the history of the digital rights struggle, because this is the moment where we can actually make the argument and make reference not to a speculative future condition that people might enter, but the real world condition that people are living through now and that they will have recently experienced when the crisis lifts. So um, take uh, our, our, uh, heart, our network infrastructure provision. Right? For, for years in the US especially, but to a lesser extent in Canada and the UK and in other parts of the world, we have left it to the private sector to do the majority of our um, allocation for uh, network capacity, um, not to provide it per se, right? That maybe, you know, the, um, the, the private sector, Comcast or Charter or AT&T decides where the wires can go, but they don't capitalize that, right? They, or they don't, they, don't pro, they don't provide it, rather. They provide the capital for the copper or for the, for the glass. Uh, or for the conduit, um, and they provide the maintenance and upkeep to a certain extent. But what they don't do is procure the largest capital expenditure involved in, uh, in, in network capacity uh, creation, which is rights of way. Um, the rights of way to, if you think of, say, Verizon in New York, uh, digging up the streets, putting glass under the, in the subways and in the sewers and, and under the ground, um, those rights of way, if Verizon had to go to every building owner and negotiate them one at a time, those rights of way would exceed the entire 
lifetime revenue of Verizon and probably every other phone company in America several times over. Uh, those rights of way constitute a public subsidy. Um, but we have accepted the argument from Verizon, from Comcast and Charter and Time Warner and so on, that because they provide the cheapest part of the capital expenditure, you know, the wire that goes in the right of way, that they are therefore the only entity that should be making decisions about what kind of plastic or glass or copper goes in the ground and what policy, what policy should obtain for it. And you know, I, I am enough of a libertarian to say that if Verizon wants to go galt and raise trillions of dollars and try to bid on every yard of sidewalk in New York that it has to dig up in order to lay its own glass or its own copper, that Verizon should be allowed to have whatever policies it wants for it. But to the extent that Verizon is taking a subsidy from the public, I think it has a duty to act in the public interest, as do all the other carriers. And so uh, one of the things that we should absolutely revisit when the crisis is over is fiber to the curb. I think that every city in America should be wired with fiber to the, fiber to the curb, and then that should be in a municipal capital expenditure, and it should be funded by typing zeros into a spreadsheet in the central bank. Um, we already have elements of that. We have the Lifeline Fund and other funds that the FCC has that go to uh, subsidizing fiber in different cities. Uh, there are inspirational stories. There's a town in Appalachia in Kentucky that's uh, the poorest predominantly white county in America. Obviously, counties that are predominantly non-white are even poorer because of structural racism, but still the poorest predominantly white county in America uh, um, now has fiber to every single home despite its rugged terrain because their um, uh, WPA descended uh, cooperative telephone company that began its life as a electrification co-op got a federal subsidy and pulled fiber to every single home in the county, including ones that were so rugged and remote that the fiber had to be pulled by a mule called Old Bub, who traversed the difficult and treacherous mountain passes with a fiber spool to get fiber into those distant farmhouses. And prior to the crisis, that county had witnessed an economic miracle of $25 an hour and up jobs, uh, providing tech support and uh, other distance services to the rest of the world. Indeed, there's a, a thriving sub-industry within this county teaching uh, the children of wealthy Chinese people to speak English. And there's a running joke in the town that there is an entire generation of Chinese princelings who are growing up speaking English with a thick Appalachian accent. So that's the first thing, is that we can no longer trust the private sector to decide how we allocate our network capacity. Network capacity should be everywhere. And if we're not running fiber to the curb and if we're bridging the last you know, 50 yards or whatever with 5G, fine. But 5G is not a technology that delivers bandwidth uh, from the backbone to the uh, person who has got the wireless receiver. 5G is a way to bridge a high-speed cable link to a wireless device, right? 5G without fiber is like a really, really, really wide open, high pressure fire hydrant that has no water main connected to it. And so even in a 5G world, we need high-speed glass to every door. Um, the next lesson that we've learned is that uh, all software that is in production use should have publicly accessible source code. Irrespective of the license, you should be allowed to both inspect and maintain source code uh, regardless of uh, the priorities of the firm that built it. And so to understand this, Think about uh, other forms of proprietary technical uh, uh, value adds in things that we procure, right? Uh, imagine, say, the, the technical know-how that goes into building the soaring atriums that are a commonplace in our hospitals, right? If you hired a firm of mechanical and structural engineers to design a hospital for you, and they said, all right, we have, we have built your atrium for you, designed your atrium for you, and it's going to soar um, several stories above the people who enter the hospital. But the math that we use to make sure that it doesn't fall on their heads and kill them all is a trade secret. And we're not going to tell you what the math is because that's how we make our money. Or what if, they, if the people who pulled the wire in the walls of your hospital said, all right, well, we are going to pull electrics, network, uh, uh, plumbing, and other infrastructure within your drywall. Um, and HVAC and so on. 
but we are not providing any as-built diagrams because um, our deal is that we make money maintaining this HVAC system and your wiring and your, your network, uh, uh, you know, your network poles and so on. And if we gave you the as-built diagrams, well, then we would not be able to offer you this service at the bargain price that we offer it to you. Irrespective of whether that's true, and I don't think it is true because we have lots of firms that are able to keep themselves in business, even though they provide as-built drawings and show you the math that they use for their, their atriums, um, we shouldn't buy those company services for our hospitals um, because uh, a hospital whose ceiling falls in is not a hospital anymore, and a hospital whose wiring fails and you can't find anyone to fix it because we're in a pandemic lockdown or because the company's gone out of business after the pandemic lockdown is also not a hospital. And in the same way, a hospital whose software stops working is not a hospital. And that is likewise true of every firm to an extent that we are now understanding, right? That, that now that every firm is connected by, uh, by uh, network links and served by those network links, there is no future for our, um, our, our firms unless they can uh, choose from a variety of service entities to service and maintain that software that is keeping them in business. Um, and then the, the last two things that I want to mention is lessons that we can take from the pandemic. The first one is about decentralization and competition. You know, the, the smarter people than me have noted that the, uh, the web has devolved into five giant services filled with screenshots from the other four. And to this, this concentration did not come about as a result of mere network effects or uh, first mover advantage. When you look at how these firms grew, what you see is that they grew by doing things that used to be illegal under our anti-monopoly laws. Um, acquiring their nascent competitors, merging with their major competitors, creating vertical monopolies that allow them to dominate whole sectors and decide who, and, who can and can't participate in those sectors. These are all things that were banned until the Reagan era, but that have been loosened with every president since uh, through something uh, called the, um, uh, the uh, public harm standard in antitrust that says that antitrust should only ever be invoked when you see short-term price rises as a result of it. So, you know, Google is a company that has grown exclusively through tactics that are classic monopoly tactics, tactics that would have been illegal prior to the Reagan era, right? Google is a company that's only made one and a half products, right? It, it made a really good search engine and a pretty good Hotmail clone. Everything else that it does, it does, that, that's successful anyways. It does because it bought a company that did that thing. And so, um, as we exit this crisis and we see how central platforms are to our everyday discourse when online life becomes real life, um, we should be engaged in uh, extreme scrutiny of any post, uh, post-crisis merger activity or acquisitions activity. It's going to be a lot of companies looking for buyers uh, in the wake of this. There are already some of them. DoorDash just got acquired by Amazon and so on we should be looking very, very carefully at any kind of merger or acquisition. We should also be contemplating breakups because what, we're, what this crisis reveals is that if you control, say, Google Classroom, you control the entire educational apparatus of America, plus or minus 5%. And to have that entire capacity controlled by a single firm is um, it's an existential crisis for the educational capacity of the country. And the educational capacity of the country is critical to the country's future. Uh, you know, we're also seeing this emerging with platforms like Zoom, which have become the dominant platform for the way that we communicate face-to-face uh, -face during the crisis. Zoom has lots of problems. You, you've probably heard about the privacy and, and encryption issues that they've suffered. Also, some of their security issues related to Zoom bombing. Um, but, you know, most recently, uh, Zoom spokespeople have started to say, well, anyone who engages in sexual activity on Zoom uh, is violating our terms of service, and if we catch them at it, we'll kick them off the platform forever. And by the way, we have this uh, poorly defined nebulous artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence service that will uh, find people who are naked and alert us to them. So. You know, I, I, I'm not myself a participant in any Zoom orgies. If that's the thing you want to do, that's up to you. But the idea that our lives 
uh, will be scripted to this fine grain, that rather than having the rights set out, say, in the Constitution, we will have the rights set out in Zoom's ter terms of service. And that rather than having um, those rights uh, adjudicated by a court, we'll have them adjudicated by a black box algorithm, um, is, is manifestly inadequate to our world. And that's the thing that was true before the crisis, but it's a thing that, that the crisis reveals and that we can take action on. And so to the extent that you have firms that attain the kind of dominance that Zoom has now attained, we should be uh, looking askance at that dominance and finding ways to add competition to the marketplace. And then the last thing I want to mention is filters. Um, filters have become uh, a, a hot button issue in the uh, in internet policy circles over the last couple of years because the European Union was proposing filters first for copyright enforcement and then for anti-terror enforcement, where they were insisting that online service providers uh, build and maintain filters that would examine all public communications, audio, video, source code, um, text, uh, and still images, compare them to databases, first of, of known copyright material, and second of known terrorist material, and then block that material from showing up at all. And, and this has not worked. Uh, the European Union adopted the uh, copyright directive last March and the terror regulation shortly thereafter. Uh, no country has managed to implement it. The EU is, is basically at this point starting to admit that the only way you could operate these filters would be to violate both data protection and privacy rules. Um, these have been, been catastrophically anti-competitive because at $100 million for each, just YouTube's content ID filter, you exclude all smaller firms from the market. You basically annihilate them at the stroke of a pen. So back to competition, you basically give YouTube and Facebook and Twitter uh, a, a, an eternal dominance of the internet. They just get to divide the internet into three pieces and never have to worry about a smaller competitor coming up. They don't, no longer have to buy their nascent competitors to prevent them from attaining dominance because those nascent competitors can't even afford to enter the marketplace. Um, filters are, of course, even worse when all of our communications are online. Um, if you add a filter that says, well, we're engaged in, in unlawful speech, you create the possibility that um, unlawful, unlawful speech uh, that they block next time will be the only form of political speech you have available to you. So, you know, that's the... Um, that's that's the those are the risks that I think that we can address with new vigor when the crisis lifts. So, um, you know, that's that's my pitch to you as as uh, as digital rights activists and as people interested in digital rights is to start thinking about how after this crisis passes, we can use the lesson it taught us, use this crisis as the dry run for the many much larger crises that are to come, to create the resilience that we will need to weather those crises. Thank you. So I think we do Q&A now. Is that right, Sean? That is correct. I'm just trying to add my camera without screwing with yours. <laughs> All right. OK, great. So uh, before we dig into the questions that are in the chat, and we've got a few, um, I have a couple questions that just sort of uh, build on um, the last few things you mentioned. Um, so the first one is, you know, you correctly point out uh, that we need to have real serious fiber to the curb. Um, and whether or not we have a mule or whatever we need in rural areas, we just need to do it. Um, and that's a much better solution than 5G for a lot of reasons, including bandwidth, et cetera. Um, but traditionally, or at least in the world we're in right now, um, it, it's hard for me to imagine, I think it's hard for a lot of people to imagine um, private uh, entities not coming in and um, sort of corrupting that process in one way or another. Uh, the two ways that it's been done in the United States, of course, is um, through uh, poor implementation. So we saw in Kansas City, you know, fiber was laid down and it was, you know, an inch below the ground in these terrible troughs that Google dug and then they just left it, right? Um, so now they left somebody holding the bag, right? Um, and the other way, of course, is uh, offering uh, these value adds, right? So now fiber to your house, let's say, right, is uh, a value add, uh, but you get surveillance. Um, and we've seen this in um, South Africa, for example. Verizon ran uh, fiber directly to very poor areas and townships. And uh, the main purpose for it was to implement surveillance cameras in those neighborhoods. So, um, mm -hmm. 
let's start there, I guess, and, and let me know what you think of that. Yeah, those are good points. I mean, there are 750 towns in America with, um, with municipal fiber. They are predominantly red state conservative towns. Uh, and those fiber loops were installed at public expense or through the provision of, of a public bond without those problems. So I guess what, what I'm saying is that fiber is a necessary but insufficient condition for better network policy, that you also need good governance to go with it. Um, and uh, attaining that good governance is uh, difficult, but uh, to the extent that we have fast networks, attaining that we have the coordinative capacity to militate for a better governance at the same time. Um, you know, I, I, I think about the city I live in. I'm, in, I'm speaking to you today from Burbank, California, which is a, a town of 100,000 people on the uh, border with North Hollywood in LA County. And uh, because Burbank has a bunch of uh, very large employers, it's really a company town, uh, notably Disney, Universal, Warner, and then formerly Lockheed, we have a 100 gigabit fiber loop that runs through the city that was paid for with a bond uh, that the city raised. Um, but the city also has an exclusive arrangement with Charter, and that arrangement with Charter prohibits them from terminating that fiber loop on any premises not zoned commercial. So uh, I pay business tax for my small home office here, and I uh, run a small business here in Burbank, but I am stuck with Charter internet uh, at a notional 384 kilobits. Actually, we're measuring it at more like, or meg, uh, megabits rather, actually we're measuring it at more like uh, 80 megabits, uh, especially during the crisis. Um, and yet that fiber loop literally runs under my house's foundation slab. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of fiber out there uh, that is closer than we think. Um, and that, you know, when the city does the costings on terminating that fiber in every house of the 100,000 of us here in Burbank, it's, you know, it's in the range of like, it's under $100 million, right? So, you know, given the amount of stimulus that we have, and given that 30% of Burbank will be unemployed when this crisis is over one way or another, and no one will be trying to procure their labor, and therefore any uh, job that they were offered that uh, that um, would, would not compete with the private sector and therefore not be inflationary, we could just put Burbank to work finishing our fiber. Right. Uh, the, the, that's, that is a, a policy avenue that is absolutely available to us. Sure. And I, I do think it's great that you point out um, how much uh, fiber is actually out there, that this stuff is really available and people may just not be aware of it. Uh, we were doing a municipal project before this whole pandemic, pandemic sort of um, blew up uh, on the East Coast. And uh, the, every single traffic box in New Haven, or at least the large majority of them, has fiber, has server racks in them, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't want to necessarily just, you know, open up municipal networks willy-nilly, um, but I'm sure there are ways in which we can use that infrastructure. Um, sure. To, yeah. And I, I worry about state surveillance affected via fiber, but I think that, you know, to the extent that... Um, that that is a concern. It is likewise a concern when it comes to private firms. That that private firms, with I, the only exception I can think of is Monkey Brains and Sonic, private firms have been pretty enthusiastic about being deputized as surveillance agents by the state uh, at, when it comes to network uh, provision. And um, the uh, the anti net neutrality shibboleth that we get about about uh, municipal networks uh, is that if uh, the government owned your network instead of, say, Charter or Comcast, that they would then use that to censor your speech, right? We, we hear this from right-wing talk show hosts, that they would be in control of your speech. And actually, if anything, I think the people who should be worried about uh, municipal governments owning networks are people on the left who want Nazis deplatformed, because as creatures of the state, municipal governments would not be allowed to deplatform you for your political beliefs, right? Uh, unlike, say, Twitter, that can have a policy that says, if we think you're a Nazi, you can't use our service. 
your city can't say that, right? Your city has to say, if you are a Nazi, you get to use our service too. So, you know, the, the idea that, that um, disfavored political voices will be sidelined by uh, municipal networks is just wrong as a, as a matter of fact. Sure. Um, so what do you think the role is of universities in all this? We're in a college town here in New Haven. Um, it's very obvious there's a lot of fiber under the ground that could serve people really well. And at least, you know, all the big college towns out there, the East Coast and the West Coast, um, do you think that universities, especially publicly funded ones, should be compelled to sort of open up their networks to the community? I don't know that they should be compelled to open their networks to the community. I, I do think that, like, as a former network administrator, you know, I, I, I understand the value of having subnets with boundaries at which you enact, you know, policy and so on to, to prevent denial of service attacks and, and cybercrime and, and what have you. But I do think that we've seen uh, procurement as a powerful lever for um, affecting network policy. Right. So, you know, universities could say, for example, we will not procure networks unless we are procuring them from uh, firms that uh, for us and for the people in our town, which include all of the people who live off campus but work on campus, uh, that is, you know, fiber to the curb, it's neutral, uh, it's reasonably priced, it has service guarantees and so on. And that, you know, but that, that, you know, being the monopsonist, right? Being the only, the, the major purchaser for the service, they could set terms that could redound to the benefit of other people around them. And especially where they're publicly funded, they could join forces with their states uh, to say, you know, no, no state agency. In fact, we, we, we've seen this in state net neutrality bills, you know, the one in Colorado, California, and so on, where they say no state agency will procure any internet uh, from a provider unless it's neutral. Um, some of them say from a provider unless all of that provider services are neutral, irrespective of whether they're being provided to a state-funded agency. Um, and that, I think, is the strong form. The weak form is so long as it's neutral for us. Awesome. Um, so the other thing um, I want to talk about, which the last two things are sort of related, um, you talk about Zoom and AI moderation of Zoom and their ability to um, you know, keep content off the platform that they consider you know, uh, porn or whatever, um, but also actually in those terms of service, and I've read through Google Hangouts, Slack, Microsoft Teams, all of them across the board, they also have clauses about violence, language, et cetera. Um, so um, you know, these things being the intermediaries now in a way in which they weren't before, you know, Microsoft Teams, for example, was like a no service and then got like 44 million users in a week or something. Um, mm -hmm. They are taking a role that's similar now to telecoms, right? Um, mm -hmm. Would you pr propose sort of, um, how would that work if we were going to sort of um, come up with rules about what they can do, how the moderation would work? And if it's not doing filters in the EU style of filtering content, and if it's not doing AI, moderation, um, and if it's not farms of poor people in Bangladesh, you know, taking the most atrocious content off of these platforms, how do we handle that sort of content moderation? So I think that you, there's two questions in that question, right? The first one is, um, what do we do about their dominance? Do we treat them like a common carrier or something? And the second one is, what do we do about the fact that moderation at scale is hard? Um, and I think that they both have uh, the seed of the same answer, which is that they need to face more competition. Um, so one of the ways that they can that we can increase the competition as a policy lever, uh, without having to revisit um, the uh, uh, the the public harm standard in, in antitrust, which I think we should revisit. One of the ways that we can do that straight away is with interoperability mandates. <clears throat> Which, you know, you see that in the Warner bill already. There's Mark Warner has a bill for uh, that affects basically Facebook and I think maybe Twitter uh, that um, mandates uh, that they expose the same APIs that they use internally between different parts of their same service to third parties through data fiduciaries who uh, are licensed and regulated by the FTC and who are um, 
uh, not allowed to be in business doing anything but being fiduciaries. They they're not allowed to have a service that competes with the service that they the services that they are acting as intermediaries for. And the way that it works is if you want to make a service that interoperates with Facebook, you go to the you find a fiduciary. The fiduciary does fiduciary duty, ensures that your purpose is valid, and then they order Facebook to provide uh, access to the to expose the same API to you that they expose between Facebook divisions. Um, now, there's obviously a lot of room for mischief in there, like they could uh, nerf down the APIs and use something else. Uh, but, you know, as a, as a first cut, this is not a, a bad thing. Um, and, you know, mandated interoperability for all the value that we get out of it, and we do get a lot of value out of mandated interoperability, um, should only ever be the floor on interop. The ceiling on interop should always be adversarial interoperability. That's that's when a new firm takes an existing product and finds ways to interoperate with it against the wishes of the manufacturer of that existing product. Right. So, um, for example, uh, when Apple was finding itself edged out of the enterprise market because of Microsoft Office and the poor compatibility with uh, Mac Office, uh, which Microsoft was making and selling, but either neglecting or deliberately sabotaging, depending on who you believe, Apple went out and they reverse engineered the entire Office Suite's file formats, and they made an interoperable suite called iWork, Pages, Keynote, Numbers. Uh, and, and that uh, allowed people who were Mac users to continue to interoperate perfectly with, with Windows users. And so the reason that we see a lot less adversarial interoperability today, the reason people aren't doing this with, say, iTunes, to make an interoperable iTunes client that reads and writes the same files and libraries, um, is that in the year since, the companies that benefited from adversarial interoperability have created a thicket around their uh, businesses, around the services and products they provide, that prohibit adversarial interoperability by new entrants, even as they were the beneficiaries of adversarial interoperability in their own origins. So uh, that thicket includes things like software patents, anti-circumvention in uh, Section 12.1 of the, of the um, Digital Money and Copyright Act, uh, trade secrecy, enforceable terms of service under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and so on, that, that basically what they've managed to do is take this basket of laws and find ways to interpret them, generally by throwing a lot of money at lawyers, um, sometimes by lobbying, sometimes by paying like experts to write law review articles, um, that, that conjure up a new offense that we could call felony contempt of business model. And so uh, dismantling this, and uh, I favor doing this through uh, a simple statutory instrument uh, that I call the interoperator's defense. So in, in finance, there's a whistleblower's defense where if you work in the finance sector um, and you find violations of finance law, irrespective of your, um, uh, com your obligations under non-disclosure agreements and, and other uh, kinds of obligations, you are permitted to disclose that information in order to uh, reveal the wrongdoing, and you are immunized from all liability under any statute that might otherwise compromise your ability to do that. And we could say, as an interoperator's defense, you are, notwithstanding any statute, you are permitted without limit to uh, take such steps as are necessary to interoperate with service, provide parts, consumables, um, or uh, patches to existing products, provided you do so on behalf of a bona fide user for a legitimate purpose. And, and obviously that's going to have to be adjudicated by courts and you will spend a lot of time in front of a judge arguing about whether your user was a bona fide user and whether your purpose was legitimate. But I would much rather have our litigation energy going to defending the legitimacy of users of register uh, of, of registered users of dominant services and the legitimacy of the um, uh, addition of pro-competitive features than arguing the purely procedural questions of did my competitor violate my terms of service did my competitor bypass a copyright access control did my competitor violate a patent Right. So, so instead, we're asking judges to investigate public policy questions, not procedural questions. 
Um, and so in so doing, we make the decisions of the platforms a lot less salient, right? Like Zoom can say, Zoom is the service that you can that you use if you don't want to have orgies. And someone else can say, this is the service you use if you do. But the two of them can talk to each other, right? That you don't have to become either a Zoom user and opt out of all the things Zoom prohibits or become a Jitsi user and opt out of talking to all the people who use Zoom. Um, and so that that's step one, right? That's how you um, that's how you manage the fact that uh, these firms, because of their dominance, when they make decisions about content, those decisions have far-reaching implications. You, you just make them less dominant. And then the the second question: How do you manage moderation at scale? Is you break the scale, right? Um, so on the one hand, uh, it is a lot easier if you say run your own uh, little. Um, service that whose whose makers are uh, dependent on you for your business right if you're if you're one of a small number of customers keeping a business afloat um, and they um, you know if you leave and you stop hosting your chats there uh, they will um, take a real hit then you have a lot more leverage to insist that they devote moderation efforts to you but also moderating you becomes a lot easier because moderation doesn't scale uh, moderation could be delegated to people who were directly at the coal face where you could give much more moderation strength to people who were involved in that community or that chat room without having to have the choices that those people make ripple out across a lot of other rooms communities service uh, elements of the service aspects of the service because it's all because those decisions are a lot more local right like it's perfectly legitimate for people inside their household to say in this house none of us say the f word right um, and that's a policy that you can make stick within your own house and moderate within your within your own house and that whose whose violations you can make determinations about in your own house you can have a swear jar um, you can send your kid to their room you can uh, say you know what it's acceptable to do it when it, under extenuating circumstances and you having hit your thumb with that hammer means that your f-bomb was was acceptable um, what you don't want to have to do is have that policy be articulated as a policy for every house and the street in front of the house. Um, you you want to be able to set those policies really close to the people who are directly affected by them and not have them ripple out. So what you're describing, uh, I think, to a large extent is uh, decentralization um, and then allowing folks to have autonomy over, you know, a Mastodon instance or, you know, whatever service they're, they're offering, right? Yeah. Not... So actually, here's the here's the order of here's the order of operations. What we need is technological self determination, and you get technological self determination through pluralism, and you get pluralism through decentralization, right? So you should be able to decide which tools you use and how they work. You get that by having lots of places, uh, lots of different ways that tools are made, and you get that by not having all the tools made by the same people. Very cool. So uh, one of the questions uh, from the chat here, which is really a big issue that you bring up, and I think uh, really bold, um, is the idea of sort of cementing uh, interop and uh, right of repair and um, open sourcing code despite the license. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure how that would go, <laughs> but it's going to be very interesting if, if proposals like that do come through. So you talked about the necessity of it. Um, how do you think that sure. would play out? Well, I mean, there's, there's two ways of addressing the legal challenges to those things. So, you know, right to repair only uh, is only a question because statutes that do not ban repair have been repurposed as bans on repair, right? The, the, the idea that you commit a copyright violation when you type an unlock code into a John Deere tractor to um, activate a real part that you lawfully acquired from John Deere or an interoperable part that John Deere uh, has no claim over um, is wrong, right? There is no copyright violation that takes place when you when you derive that unlock code and type it into your console. Um, no, no, none of the exclusive rights to uh, you know as defined under copyright to duplication, display, adaptation, uh, and so on, uh, and performance of your copyrighted software have taken place 
in the typing of the number into the console. But Section 12.1 of the DMCA says that if you have a lock that restricts access to a copyrighted work, then bypassing that lock is uh, a violation and giving someone a tool to bypass that lock is a felony, uh, irrespective of whether any copyright violation ever takes place. So there's a way to fix that, which is to reform the DMCA or strike it down. At EFF, we have a lawsuit, the, the Green uh, v. DOJ lawsuit, where we're defending, uh, representing Matthew Green and, and Andrew Bunny Wang in a lawsuit to overturn Section 12.1 of the DMCA on constitutional grounds. Um, and uh, so you might either convince Congress to uh, strike down or modify Section 1201, or you might convince a court to strike down or, or modify Section 1201. But there's another way to do it, which is to create a new statutory instrument that says, irrespective of 1201, irrespective of any law, it is not a, it is not a crime, it is not an offense to do this for a legitimate purpose. You can enumerate some of those purposes as we do with, say, fair use, right? And But then as also with fair use, you can uh, establish that those principles constitute a set of guidelines, that they are not dispositive, they are exemplary. Um, and those guidelines can be interpreted by courts more broadly. Now, fair use is a problem, right? Fair use, as Lawrence Lessig says, is the right to hire a lawyer, right? But um, right now we don't have the right to hire a lawyer. Right? The right to hire a lawyer is a huge step forward. And of course, these are not mutually exclusive uh, approaches, right? We can, on the one hand, promulgate uh, a, an interoperator's defense. And on the other hand, we can seek to address the laws. But I think uh, addressing the laws in itself is not sufficient. As we see with, say, the Oracle case over whether or not copyrights are, AP, are, are APIs are copyrightable, um, the, with enough excess rents from monopoly, firms have uh, effectively unlimited capacity to seek out ways to repurpose existing statutes for anti-competitive purposes. And so what we can do instead is enshrine a pro-competitive defense that acts as a check on that. Um, at the same time, I think we also you know, need to understand the structural uh, contributors to the promulgation of these new anti-competitive theories. Um, and those uh, structural ones are, are the extraction of monopoly rents through an anti-competitive marketplace that allow firms to have slush funds to spend on lawyers and lobbyists to find new ways to uh, preserve and maintain their monopolies. So if we can nerf the monopolies, we deprive firms of the excess rents that they need to maintain them, right? That these are, that both monopoly and anti-monopoly are self-replicating phenomena. So um, I think something that's interesting about the idea of um, fundamentally changing uh, the way copyright works uh, in the United States and, and elsewhere, right? Um, is that not only proprietary schemes, you know, awful proprietary software that's not opening up the code, that's spying on users and, you know, grabbing all this data and, and selling it and so on, they would obviously have to change their business models in, in this world, right? Um, but also, I think to a large extent, uh, companies which now call themselves open source would have to do that, that too. Um, they mm -hmm. take for granted, for example, that, and the copyright law allows you to do this, um, I can write some code, I can, you know, give it to you under some terms, right? And then I can open source that code, put it under the GPL, right? Um, and put it out on GitHub. And the terms that we, you know, figure out can be completely different, which allows us to lock down parts of the platform, it allows us to discriminate, et cetera, et cetera. And in the last year, at least, um, I've been seeing sort of a proliferation of that business model. A lot of people talking about open mm. core or writing new licenses. Do you think now with the pandemic, um, there'll be a shift? Well, I mean, look at it this way. There, there's, there's a couple of things that are going to happen after the pandemic. Um, one of them is that we're going to have 30% unemployment, right, um, after this pandemic. And one of two things will happen as a consequence of that. Um, the first one is that we will leave those people unemployed, in which case it will be so destabilizing to our civilization that probably most of these questions will cease to be important because... Um, Civilized societies with 30% unemployment don't do anything. Notably, what they don't do is develop and field vaccines. Um, they also don't address climate change. Uh, they, they instead are roiled in uh, riots, protests, uh, um, you know, dysfunction, and, and then face collapse. So that's one possibility. The other one is that we're going to pick up the, that, uh, we're going to procure that labor by states, right? That the governments will procure the labor through some form of jobs guarantee or WPA or something. In which case, 
there will be an enormous amount of non-market labor doing things that were historically done by markets, uh, including preparing and fielding software. Um, and so one way or the other, there's going to be a giant pool of workers doing work that is disconnected from the market incentives you describe. And so I actually think that that within a year or two, the landscape that you're describing will be unrecognizable because of non-market production of the same goods that you're describing. I tend to agree, yeah. Um, it is going to be quite interesting to see how these, these things go. Um, I mean, so, either that or we're all going to be digging through rubble looking for canned goods and drinking our own urine, right? I mean, one or the other, right? Some of us are, are getting closer to that day by day, unfortunately. Um, I've found myself yeah. eating dandelions, which is very interesting. <laughs> getting very Ray Bradbury of you. <laughs> there you go. I'm working on it. Um, so just to kind of tie together a couple questions I see in the chat and also some private uh, conversations coming through the Matrix channels. Um, we're, you know, getting up there in age. We're not the, you know, new tech generation that's inheriting this world that that is just being destroyed all around us. Um, so questions about patents and, and the things we were talking about, as you say, may not really matter soon. Um, mm. how, how do you feel about um, this new generation? How can they continue moving forward? How can they have some bit of hope? And I guess related to that, you know, um, how have you been coping? What are your ways of sort of getting through the day? So I think we can we can talk about three generations of tech workers who are in the field today from the era of the personal computers, the post mainframe, the, the consumer tech industry workers um, who are in the field today. So there's my generation who are the first dot com generation. They were the um, people who at a moment in which there was a, an overly exuberant investment bubble, came into the field with skills that were not derived from formal education because CS was, was kind of a sideline in the 80s and the early 90s, um, but instead derived from enthusiasm. So they were the hobbyists who got lucky. It's like, it's like being, you know, really into, you know, building miniature ships and bottles and then suddenly there's like a huge bubble for miniature ships and bottles and you and everyone who knows anything about building a miniature ship and a bottle can get work and you know stock options and and just just be like a high flyer right so th and that you know a lot of those people were not in tech fields you know i joke that the dot-com bubble converted a bunch of pension funds into subsidies for humanities majors to learn pearl uh and um and and that's that that's gen one um, the dot-com bubble bursts, uh, and the second bubble is a finance-driven bubble, right? The, the, well, the first one was finance-driven too, but the second bubble, most of the participants are also finance-driven, right? So it's not just the investors who are finance-driven, it's also the, the tech workers who are finance-driven. Uh, in the second bubble, the people who start to fill those jobs are people who often went into technical certification uh, either in, in uh, technical schools or in universities and colleges, specifically because they perceive there to be a large upside. They might have gone into finance itself 10 years before, but they went into CS because they thought that you could become a tech founder and then you could uh, cash out and then you could be a millionaire for the rest of your life. And that second generation, I think, is where you see a lot of like mom as a service. Uh, you know, like um, uh, we will, we will treat the huge pool of low-waged, immiserated, desperate laborers left behind by the 2008 crisis as substitutes for robots, and we'll just procure their labor like with apps, and we will have them do the menial chores that our mothers used to do for us uh, in traditional uh, gender gender role households, you know, uh, pick up your laundry and have it laundered, uh, pick you up in the car and drive you home, um, you know, go to the go to the grocery store for you, and so on. Then that, that's that second wave kind of tech bro finance wave. The third wave are the workers who staged the tech walkout. Uh, the the twenty thousand Googlers who walked out last year, the uh, uh, Amazon employees who were just fired because of their solidarity with Amazon workers. Uh, and so Amazon warehouse workers and so on. And these are people who 
got tech jobs for whatever reason. They were enthusiasts. They thought that they would be good jobs, whatever. They went into the tech industry, but they had, but they saw the industry not as a get rich quick scheme, but as just a solid job, right? It's like becoming a doctor. You know, you go, you do your time, you learn your skills, you will work predictable hours, uh, you will make a good solid living, um, but you are never going to be part of an IPO because the only way that startups can become, can blow up into big firms these days is through acquisitions by Google and, and Facebook and so on. So really, if you get involved in a startup, it's just an aqua hire bid. It's basically doing a graduate project uh, to impress a recruiter at a big tech firm. It's not actually starting a business. Um, and those people are having kind of a string of Oppenheimer moments. They're waking up and going, well, wait a second. Uh, you know, I got into this to have a good solid job, not to enable facial recognition for ICE uh, or not to uh, write AI for drones. Um, and that's the third wave, right? And those are the people who started to flex their muscles because they were like, well, no one wants to give us millions of dollars for our labor. No one wants to like, you know, our labor does not constitute a lottery ticket, but the tech industry is very central. There aren't enough of us in it which is why our labor is being procured at such a premium. And if we were to stop showing up, maybe no one would ever do this, right? Like we have actual power. Like I, maybe the reason that our employers are providing us with free kombucha and massages is not because they're big hearted slobs. Maybe it's because they're really worried that we'll work for the other tech giant across the street. In which case, if we all just stop going to work because we're angry about the drones or because Andy Rubin got $80 million after being outed as a sexual predator, maybe our employers will have to listen to us. And and that was, I think, one of the most inspiring transformations I've seen of any labor movement in the last couple of years, that and the low-wage service workers getting involved with like SEIU and other service unions and staging walkouts in the fight for 15. And the convergence of those two, the solidarity between those two has been very, very exciting. And now we're in, now we're headed for a fourth wave, right? The post-pandemic wave, right? If my daughter grows up to be a tech worker, she's 12 now, you know, if she grows up to be a tech worker, her tech life will be defined by whatever we do after this. Um, and I have no idea what that's going to look like, right? It, it, it could either be consolidation to an extent like never seen before. Like we let Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook take the money that they hid in offshore uh, tax havens and uh, spend it to acquire every failing tech company and become like uh, permanent, you know, internet lords. Or it could become an age of unprecedented pluralism and public spirited technology development. We, we don't know what the outcome will be, right? Like in between that first wave and the second wave after the dot com crash, but before the second bubble, that was in, in many ways, I think, the most interesting era because it was the era in which people did things because they were really passionate about them and they had the skills right. to make them. You know, you had the passion beforehand, but then you got the then you got the passion and the skills and and no one trying to trying to um, procure those skills and that passion in the service of Internet dog food companies. Very cool. Um, and then what do I do? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I. You know, I'm doing what I can. I'm, I'm staying busy. I mean, my my coping skill for my whole life has been to be as busy as possible so that I don't have to think about the stuff that's making me crazy. And so I'm really busy. I'm working on a novel. I'm working on a, an article today. Uh, I'm recording podcasts. I'm doing speeches. Uh, I'm, I just wrote a huge position paper for EFF on surveillance capitalism. Uh, I'm just like running around as quickly as possible so I never have to be alone with my thoughts to be perfectly frank. You're not the only one. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, we're gonna end that here, but do you have anything you wanna sort of plug and talk about that you're working on? I could mention that, you know, I have three books out this year and there may not be any bookstores to sell them. So uh, if you're into books, maybe you could order them. Uh, the first one is a picture book out in July called Posey the Monster Slayer. It's about a little girl who doesn't wanna go to bed and so instead, she tears apart her toys and makes field expedient monster hunting weapons and hunts the monsters in her bedroom. And her parents keep coming in and telling her to go back to bed. And they're slowly turning into zombies. And the final monster battle is her fighting the zombie parents. And she loses, but they only tuck her in. Uh, the second one is a reissue of my novels, Little Brother and Homeland, uh, under an, uh, in one set of covers with a new introduction by Edward Snowden. And that's out on July the 7th. 
And then the third book that's coming out is the third little brother novel, which is out on October the 12th. That's called Attack Surface. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and if you'd like to stick around, if you can, um, please do. I got to go do class, uh, office hours for uh, CS professor students. So on, micro on Microsoft Teams. <laughs> Enjoy. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks, Sean. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.